Today we're at just plain stupid now. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today, a quick market update and some thoughts about where the markets actually are. At the close in New York, the Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 0.67% on Friday, while the S&P 500 index gained 1.09% and the Nasdaq Composite climbed 1.44%. The strong rebound for Wall Street comes just a day after markets were roiled by news that Biden is set to propose doubling the capital gains tax on wealthy Americans. The drop, which came on Thursday afternoon, was widely blamed on news reports that President Joe Biden would propose hiking the capital gains tax rate on people earning more than $1 million from 20% to 39.6%. Combined with an existing surcharge, high-income individuals would face a capital gains rate as high as 43.4%. Cue the number crunchers, who were quick to point out an important fact about changes in the capital gains tax rate. History shows they don't have much, if any, effect on stock market returns. In the most recent example, capital gains tax rates jumped by nearly 9 percentage points in 2013, but stocks rose 30% that year. In addition, there's no correlation between capital gains rates and equity market valuations. Price to earnings multiples have been as low as 10 times when the capital gains tax rate was 20% and as high as 18 times when it was 35%. Ultimately, other factors, such as the outlook for economic growth, monetary policy and interest rates are much more powerful drivers of equity market returns and valuations, UBS has said. Analysts also noted that the proposals as reported was largely in line with Biden's 2020 election campaign pledges and shouldn't have come as any surprise. The initial market reaction may be more about investor psychology. With a lot of good news already priced into markets, stocks could be vulnerable to negative surprises, whether from growth disappointments, higher inflation or policy missteps. As a result, the plan could contribute to pockets of volatility ahead. The bullish down Wall Street comes ahead of the Federal Reserve's decision next Wednesday. Fed Chairman Powell will likely reinforce previous guidance for rate hikes and push back against tapering, emphasising that there has been no substantial progress and that the Fed will provide plenty of notice before tapering, National Australia Bank said. In fact, on Thursday, the US Census Bureau reported that new home sales as viewed through a seasonally adjusted annual rate came in at 1 million and 21,000 in March. That's the fastest growth of new home sales since 2006. In the bond market, Treasuries once again showed a lack of direction before ending the day in the red. As a result, the yield on the benchmark 10-year note, which moves opposites to its price, inched up by 1.3 basis points to 1.567. According to Reuters, 10-year yields have stabilised and the inflation rebound to 2.6%. Well above target is likely to be short-lived. Still, swaps show that market expectations of future inflation are rising and that means Treasury volatility may not yet be over. Even with strong tailwinds from dollar weakness today, gold prices were still unable to close positively on the day, and the dollar index lost 0.55% in trading on Friday, closing at 90.83. The US dollar has now closed lower on a weekly basis for the last three consecutive weeks. Four weeks ago, on the week of March 29, the dollar index closed at 92.90. Since the last week of March to current pricing, the dollar index has roughly dropped 2.1%. On the pandemic front, worries about rising global cases intensified after infections in India jumped to a one-day record and Japan declared its third state of emergency in Tokyo. 
The best performers of the session on the Dow Jones were Goldman Sachs, which rose 2.56% to 339.33, financials were pushed higher by a surge in the regional banking stocks as the wave of better than expected earnings for the sector continued, supported by a reinflationary environment. Switzerland based Credit Suisse reported a net loss of $275 million in the first quarter of 2021 thanks to the scandals linked to Luckling Coffee, Wirecard, Greensill, and Archegos. The bank has suspended its share buyback and cut dividends. Investors were also not impressed by Credit Suisse raising $2 billion to bolster its capital despite their commitments to strong risk management ahead. Management stressed it was a proactive move to end speculation about its capital levels. The issue will dilute shareholders' equity by about 8%, but it is probably necessary to reassure wealth management clients that the bank is solid. However, the bank has also reported massive growth in its other services, including wealth management and investment banking. Credit Suisse reported an 80% growth in its investment banking sector in the first quarter. And of course, many of the big firms are profiting from the current market volatility. Many of them are driving much more profitability from trading than from lending. The worst performers of the session were Intel Corporation, which fell 5.32% to trade at 59.24 after it beat first quarter estimates and raised its guidance. But the sharp pace of recovery in its stock price ahead of the report was perhaps too much too soon. Intel is mostly doing the right things, but results will be painful over an elongated period as revenues suffer from past missteps and costs increase as Intel invests in its turnaround strategy. Net, our view remains that the stock recovered too quickly and we continue to see near-term downside from current levels, one analyst said. The volatility index was down 7.38% to 1733 signalling relative calm. European stock markets edged lower on Friday, ending the week on a negative tone as investors study a slew of corporate earnings, particularly from Daimler and economic data releases. The DAX in Germany traded 0.27% lower to 15,279, while the UK's FTSE was flat at 6,938. Upbeat economic data failed to give UK stocks a boost on Friday, with the pound surging and shares of heavily weighted AstraZeneca, Diego and Unilever leading the way south. It looks like a hangover from Wall Street, with COVID-19 pandemic fears in particular. On top of that, the strength of sterling is also working against the FTSE 100 in particular, said Richard Hunter, head of markets at Interactive Investor. The FTSE 100 index was 1.7% down on the week, the first losing weekly session in three. And the pound US dollar was up 0.34% to 1.3883, which was weaker across the board as investors fretted about a report that the Joe Biden administration was considering those tax hikes. UK investors were absorbing a fresh batch of data starting with the GFK Consumer Confidence Barometer, which stood at minus 15 in April, a one-point gain from the previous month. While the reading set a new COVID-19 pandemic high, the one-month increase was much lower than the seven-point hike registered in March and February's five-point rise. The survey indicated that Britons remain cautious about the pandemic and its economic consequences, said Joshua Mahoy, senior market analyst at IG. Other data showed a jump in retail sales for March, a surge of 5.4% against the previous month, with gains by non-food stores and jumps of 17.5% and 13.4% in clothing stores and other non-food stores respectively, amid a gradual easing in COVID-19 restrictions in the country. With many having saved heavily over the course of the past year, clothing sales in particular gained traction as shops prepared for the improving weather, said Mahoy. Undoubtedly, the reopening of non-essential stores in April will ensure 
another fresh surge in spending this month with the economic outlook in the UK improving with each passing month. The IHS market CIPS flash UK composite output index climbed to 60 in April. That's an 89 month high, with the service index as an 80 month high of 60.1. In more than 23 years of PMI, that's Purchasing Managers Index history, we've only seen one spell of faster growth than this, recorded between August and November 2013, said Chris Williamson, Chief Business and Economist at IHS Market, in a press release. European markets suffered a negative handover from Wall Street, with the major US indices all dropping, of course, around 0.9% late on Thursday. That, of course, again related to President Biden's proposal about doubling capital gains tax for the wealthy. But that said, losses were small, helped by signs of an improving economic picture in Europe as a whole. French and German manufacturing PMI numbers came in better than expected, well above the 50 expansion threshold. European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde assured the market on Thursday that pullbacks in the central bank's emergency programme were not under discussion, despite its prediction of a strong rebound in the Eurozone economy from mid-year. This comes as the region starts to get to grips with the latest wave of COVID-19 infections as it ramps up its vaccination program. France, for example, is set to reopen its schools on Monday and lift domestic travel curbs, which started earlier in the month. And that'll be on May the 3rd. In the corporate sector, Daimler rose 1.6% after the German carmaker raised its profit outlook for 2021, even while warning that the global semiconductor chip shortage may continue to affect sales in the second quarter. Oil prices edged higher on Friday, boosted by the improving economic conditions in Europe and the US, but concerns about the second wave of COVID-19 in India kept a cap on the gains. US crude futures traded 1.01% higher to 62.15 a barrel, with losses of just under 2% over the week on concerns of weakening fuel demand in India, the world's third largest oil importer, as the country sets records for daily infections and deaths from the COVID-19 virus. India recorded almost 315,000 new cases on Thursday, prompting a number of countries, including Australia, Britain and Canada, to restrict the number of flights from the region. Asia-Pacific stocks were mostly up on Friday, steadying after broad-based declines in their US counterparts, as investors continue to digest a US proposal for higher taxes to fund the country's latest social plan. Japan's Nikkei 225 fell 0.57% to 29,020, with the government preparing to declare a COVID-19 state of emergency in Tokyo, Osaka, Kyoto and Hyogo prefectures from April the 25th to May the 11th. Eateries serving alcohol, establishments with karaoke equipment and commercial facilities with floor space of 1,000 square metres and over will be asked to close as part of the latest measures. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index jumped 1.15% and China's Shanghai Composite was up 0.26% to 3,474. And South Korea's KOSPI inched up 0.1%, while in Australia the ASX 200 edged up 0.08% to 7,060. And the S&P ASX 200 volatility was down 3.35% to 11.515, again highlighting calm. Gold futures for June delivery was down 0.31% to 1,776. Gold prices over the last four trading weeks have risen from the second of a double bottom which occurred during the week of March 29, when gold traded to a low of 1,677, to the high this week of 1,798.80. In the last four trading weeks, gold has had a range of over $100. It was a crushing disappointment for many as the yellow metal, which was expected to repeatedly approach $1,800, actually met resistance. 
The last time COMEX gold traded above that level was on February the 25th. And the euro US dollar was up 0.68% to 1.2096. With the Federal Reserve's monthly meeting due next Wednesday, analysts say gold prices are likely to drift without substantive guidance from the US central bank. Dampening demand for safe havens have capped the rally in gold, said Ed Moyer, analyst at New York's Uwanda. Gold prices will likely consolidate leading up to the Fed between $1,760 and $1,800. And the price of Bitcoin temporarily dropped below the psychologically important $50,000 level on Friday, putting the digital asset on track for its worst weekly performance since March, as traders appeared unable to shake worries over a potential rise in the US capital gains tax rate for wealthy investors. Bitcoin was down 0.22% to 50,219 after trading below $48,000 to touch a level last seen in early March. The digital asset fell 18.3% for the week, its biggest such fall since the week ended March 13, 2020, according to Dow Jones Market Data Group. The losses of Bitcoin represents around a 21% drop from a recent peak of 64,829 for the cryptocurrency. A 20% drop, of course, meets the widely accepted definition of a bear market. Bitcoin saw a sharp slide last weekend, though the cryptocurrency volatility meant slides of more than 10% are actually not unusual. Fears of increased regulation were at the heart of last Sunday's pullback. Then came President Joe Biden's weighing in on the plan to nearly double capital gains tax on the wealthy. While stocks bounce back on Friday, it is clear that Bitcoin is more sensitive to capital gains tax threats than most asset classes. The threat of regulation, either directly in developed markets or indirectly via the tax man, has always been crypto's Achilles heel, in my opinion, said Jeffrey Haley, senior market analyst at Onda, to clients in the note. Helly said the next Bitcoin level he was watching out for was $42,000, which might come this weekend or next week or perhaps not at all. Hopefully we will hear as many experts saying this is a sign of Bitcoin becoming a maturing mainstream asset if it falls 10% this weekend as we do when it rises or when crypto exchanges choose to IPO, he said. A number of analysts have warned of a near-term downturn for Bitcoin as the cryptocurrency has continued to track lower after reaching that all-time peak of $64,000. And that related, of course, also to the direct listing of cryptocurrency platform Coinbase, which, by the way, closed down 0.63% to 29160 Now, there was a very interesting perspective from a Californian registered investment advisor, Tim Knight, he says, here is the Dow Jones Industrials going all the way back to when people still used horses to get around and having running water in the house was a luxury. And note the channel pattern from the peak of the Roaring Twenties to the present Fiat Twenties. Now, if you zoom in on the last quarter century, which begins with the internet bubble and comes right up to the present, you can see we last tagged that century-long trend line in 1999, and then we've done so repeatedly in the past few years. If you zoom in further still, you can see, tinted in pink, numerous times when the market topped out and took a fall. The last time this happened was at the beginning of 2020, which is when we got the most exciting fall in the market in a dozen years. Since then, it's been thanks to Powell's trillions and trillions of support vomiting higher without a care or concern, shattering the bounds of a resistance line that had been placed for a solid century. This is what, he said, I call the JPS zone, which is just plain stupid. What I mean by that is that long-term patterns matter, he said. The longer they are, the more they matter. Late in 2019 and early 2020, it's not like the world was devoid of assistance from the central banks of the world. On the contrary, the central banks have been drowning the markets in, quote, help since 1987. And that help 
went into overdrive starting in 2008. Even so, the trend line continued to be obeyed, and all holy hell broke loose in February 2020, without one moment of warning. Thus, we should have fallen again quite hard, starting two or three months ago. And yet we're out here, he said, in the ionosphere. When the next fall comes, he said, I think it will be even more violent than what we saw during the COVID crash. And the things that governments use to fix it will be even stupider than anything else they've done in the past, if you can imagine that. I would also state that if you look at a broader equity index, such as the S&P 500, its own patterns quite plainly show what a precarious position equities are in right now. The levels we are at are just plain stupid, and this ain't going to last, honestly. And I have to agree with that. I think there is a significant chance of a correction. It's just that it's very hard to call when it's going to happen. And when it does happen, it may well happen very quickly. And interestingly, of course, if it does happen, and if prices drop significantly, the central banks will try to throw more liquidity at the same problem. It won't work. We are, as he says, in the zone of plain stupidity. So let's just go through the market movements on Friday in Australia. The ASX 200 was up 0.08% to 7,060. The Financial Services Index was up 0.4% to 6,222. And the Real Estate Trusts were up 0.14% to 1,465. The Local Volatility Index was down 3.35% to 11.51, indicating a very quiet market. The S&P ASX 200 futures was up 0.46% to 7,037. Amongst the banks, the ANZ was up 0.42% to 28.70. CBA was also up 0.28% to 89.39. NAB was up 0.27% to 2646. Westpac was up 0.04% to 2512. Bank of Queensland was up 1.56% to 912. Bendigo and Adelaide Bank was up 1.53% to 1059. Suncorp was up 0.78% to 1040. Macquarie Group was up 1.31% to 158.45. AMP was up 0.89% to 1.135, but continues to languish. Genworth was up 0.74% to 2.71. McGrath was up 0.65. Yellow Brick Road was at 0 0.090. AFG was up 0.72% to 280. Mortgage Choice was at 1.92. Afterpay Touch was down 1.18% to 123.56. And CIMEC was up 3.01% to 1782. The Aussie US dollar was up 0.15% to 77.46. The Euro Aussie dollar was up 0.2% to 1.5617. The two year bond was down 12.74% to 0 0.074. The benchmark three-year bond was down 9.4% to 0 0.106, while the 10-year bond was up 0 0.21 to 
to 1.685. The gold Aussie dollar cross was down 0.9% to 2,293, while the Bitcoin Aussie cross was up 2.23% to 64,828. And talking of plain stupidity, the Morrison government's pre-flirtation with cutting the super guarantee increase looks to be over, relegated once and for all to the too hard pile. This is how the super wars ended, not with a bang but with a whimper. Recent media reports indicate that the Morrison government will no longer move ahead with an attempt to cut the SG increase in the face of widespread opposition from the industry and federal labour. Throughout COVID-19, members of the Morrison government have quietly pitched a number of alternatives, an optional increase, a temporary freeze, and more controversially allowing access to superannuation for a home deposit. That campaign is still being pursued by partisan backbenchers to little effect. Of course, nothing ever ends. That news about the Morrison government's efforts to press ahead with the increase was leaked in the same manner as news about the efforts to change how superannuation works. It hardly means they've decided on a course of action. This is policy by public opinion. If the Morrison government thinks that a cut will be popular with voters, they would have moved ahead with one. There's just no evidence that it is popular, and even if it was, they'd be battling federal labour, which would have no issue with using superannuation as a weapon during the election, and industry super funds that have flagrantly pursued an emotive advertising campaign to preserve the increase in the face of the findings of the Retirement Income Review, and potentially the sole purpose test. And a potentially tougher battle looms. The Your Future, Your Super reforms face heated opposition from all sides of the superannuation industry, with everything from the new best financial interest duty to the investment veto power under heavy fire. The Morrison government now has less than 80 days before the YFYS tentative start date of 1 July, with no end to the deadlock in sight. Pressing ahead with a cut at the same time, they're trying to drive through sweeping changes to how superannuation works would likely command more resources than the Morrison government can realistically bring to bear, especially amid a botched vaccine rollout and the sexual harassment scandals that have rocked Canberra in recent months. So standing back, you can conclude that we are still in funny territory where prices are too high, political actions are being taken on weird bases, and there is very little strategic thinking here or internationally, frankly. We seem to be bouncing from crisis to crisis. It's just all plain stupid. And finally, just a quick reminder that on Tuesday, on our live stream event at 8pm Sydney, I'll be joined by Damien Classen from Nucleus Wealth and we'll be discussing the latest on the financial markets there and posing the question about investing locally versus investing globally in the current environment that we're in. So mark your diary and join us at 8pm Sydney and all the details are in the comments below. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.